Has that whetted your appetite? Matthew van der Poel and Lotte Capecchi there winning last year's Tour of Flanders in fine style. Both will be back in action this Sunday for what will be the 20th edition of the women's race and the 107th of the men's. Coming up now, everything you need to know about the routes for this year, the riders taking part and the all-important weather watch. Let's start with the men's route, which this year begins in Brugge for the first time since 2016. Over the coming six years, the start will alternate between Antwerp, where the race has started for the last six years, and Brugge, which hosted the start for 19 years from 1998. Now, the first part of the race is generally on wide and flat roads, and that is where the early breakaway will try and form. Sometimes that will happen in the first 10k, sometimes it takes closer to 100. If things go as they normally would, a group of six to ten riders will be a few minutes in front of the bunch when they hit the first cobblestones of the day at Hoos Point Weg after 109 kilometers of racing. Yeah, soon after that, they hit the first of 19 climbs, or bergs as they're called, at Corte Ast. Is that how you pronounce it? Corte, Corte, Corte Ast. My, my Flemish is terrible because <laughs> I lived there for so long. At Corte Ast, after which they'll pass through Odenada for the first time in the day. The second climb of the day is the first of three ascents of the Oud Quarmont. It will feel really early in the race, but they'll already have ridden 137 kilometers by that point. In total, it's two kilometers from the foot to the very top, but it's the first part that is the toughest, around 8% average gradient for quite some time over some very rough cobbles. Yeah, they will have a bit of brief respite after that, but once they get to Kortekir, the climbs and cobbles come thick and fast. The Eichenberg, the Mollenberg, the Berendries, and the Wolvenberg all feature on this part of the course, which is where things should start to get a bit tasty. Yeah, it's in this area where it can get dangerous for the big favorites, who don't generally go on the attack until the second time up the Quarmont or after. Last year, in this period of the race, we saw the likes of Pedersen, Van Hooydonk, Turner and Betiol get into a dangerous looking move that in turn meant that UAE had to ride hard on the front of the bunch far earlier than they would have liked. It worked though, didn't it? Because by the time they got to the second passage of the Quarmont, the group was almost brought back and then up it, Pogaccia passed every single rider from it one by one. I still can't believe how fast he went up that last year. In this edition, that second part of the Quarmont comes with 219 kilometers already in the legs. At the top, they'll briefly be on the main road before turning left and heading down the fast and technical descent to the foot of the Paterberg. Yeah, only 390 meters long, but with 20% gradients, it is a real brute of a climb, particularly as it's almost arrow straight. So you can see those gradients rearing up in front of you. Unlike in the warm-up races, you'd say, there are barriers on both sides of the road for the Tour of Flanders, so you can't ride on the smooth bit on the side, can you? Makes it so much harder. Although you can ride on the even smaller concrete slabs if you are particularly skillful. Both Van der Poel and Peacock have done that in the past, but it is a bit risky as it's only about five centimeters wide. Yeah, it's, it's too much. It's showboating, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? If you can do that in the Tour of Flanders, you are a cycling god, basically. And now over the top, they will be greeted with another fast ascent. And then they've got about 6K of flat before the infamous Koppenberg. Now that is where Dylan Van Baarle has attacked for about the last 20 years in a row. So that also, we should point out, uh, it's there where Lloydie got away in the 2009 Tour of Flanders. Would you believe it? He's not here, so he can say that. Um, anyway, it's a great place to go uh, because the group is normally small enough by then that everyone is looking at each other and not willing to chase. It did work for Van Baal last yeah, year. Yeah, it did, Didn't yeah. it? He and Fred Wright had a nice little buffer on the Koppenberg and then got caught by Van der Poel, Pogaccia and Madwa after they gapped the rest over that climb. Yeah, trouble is, will more and more people start to realize that that is a great place to go? I guess we will find out on Sunday, won't we? Anyway, now is probably a good time to remind you of the brutality of the Koppenberg. If you look at Strava, the main part of the climb is 500 meters in length with an average gradient of over 13% and a max gradient of almost 22%. Hence why we've seen even the world's top pros take an embarrassing walk up the climb. <laughs> Slip there and it is very hard to get going again. The drag over the top is particularly painful too, particularly if the rider in front of you has the power to accelerate. Yeah, from there, it's on to the main road between Odenada and Ronsa before the fun resumes. The Steinbeck Dreis leads them to Stationsburg and then the Tyenberg, also known as the Boonenberg after Tom Boonen, of course. By this point in the race, it's likely he's been pieces, but there are still three climbers remaining. 
The first of those is the Kreuzberg, a cobble climb out of Ronsa, and then after a main road climb, we've got the fast run-in that takes them to the Quarmont, and then the Paterberg for the final time. From the Paterberg, it is just over 13k to the finish line in Odenada. 13 of those most nondescript kilometers you can imagine made only slightly exotic in nature because this is one of the biggest bike races in the world. Yeah, that last part probably isn't part of anyone's bucket list, but the climbs definitely should be. If you've never done them, I really recommend heading out there at some point. If nothing else, it gives you a sense of just how impressive it is that they ride over them so fast. Yeah, it's, you know what? It was the descents that got me. Yeah. Like, it's super sketchy, isn't it? I mean, how narrow it is, covered in, like, mud and cow poo, basically. Yeah, it's and then after 200 kilometers, when the adrenaline's flowing and you're starting to fatigue. Yeah. Nuts. It is proper nuts, yeah. And also, not even just how fast they ride, how fast they walk up the Koppenberg as well. Remarkable. Uh, anyway, either way, they will finally reach the finish in Odenada after a whopping 274 kilometers of racing. The longest edition of Flanders, we should say, in 25 years for the men there. It's a big one. That's only 20 kilometers short of the Milan Sarima distance, actually. Yes, yeah, is... which is infamously long, isn't it? And there's an awful lot more climbing. Uh, right then, on to the women's race now, which starts in Odenada, as it has done since its inception in 2004. Bit of trivia for you. Making this the 20th edition of the race. They have just 10 kilometers until they get the first climb of the day, the Tegenberg, perhaps an opportunity for early attacks. But after that, it's a further 40 kilometers to the next difficult climb of the day and the first of the cobblestones at the Hoys Point Weg. Yeah, the race then follows the men's route for a little while, but rather than heading back into Odenada, they take a left turn and head eastwards towards the next climbs of the day. And there are a lot of them in quick succession. The Wolvenberg is the first of them, closely followed by two cobblestone stretches at Kirkgate and Yachere. Then comes the Mollenberg, Marlborstrat, Berengeries and Volkenberg, all in the space of just 13 kilometers. <laughs> oh my word, from there, there is a brief bit of respite, you'd be pleased to hear, down the main road, but then the climbing resumes, and it resumes with the hardest of them all, the Koppenberg. Now, there will be an enormous fight for position going into the foot of that one. You can be sure, can't you? Yeah, from the Koppenberg, it's exactly the same run into Udenard as the men's race, including that final double punch of Quarmont and Paterberg, and the same main road into the finish line. Total distance, 158 kilometers, or just short of 100 miles. Now, those of you who have been listening carefully to the routes will have realized that there is no Nocteberg this year, also known as the Côte du Trieux. Unfortunately, that means there's no reason to show you footage of Lloydie crashing there. But um, we're going to show it anyway. Yeah! I think it's fine to show that, you know, given yeah. that we bigged him up and said he attacked just before the Koppenberg. Give so, some balance. Anyway, yeah, it never gets old, that video, does it? I mean, even though it technically it is old, it's 12 years old. But uh, anyway, the wounds may have healed, but the pride still hasn't for poor old Dan. Uh, anyway, you will see that video featured on our How to Win Flanders documentary, which came out this time last year. If you didn't see it at the time, it is a cracking insight into the race and its history. You can, of course, find it on GCM Plus, tucked in amongst 150 other awesome documentaries. And whilst we're promoting things, time to tell you all about live coverage on Sunday. It will start bright and early on GCM Plus at 8.45 GMT with the breakaway of live coverage from kilometre zero of the men's race starting around a half an hour after that. Yeah, if you are watching coverage with the breakaway, it'll transition into the women's race soon after the men's has finished. But if you'd like to watch all the live coverage of the women's race, that starts from 14.30 GMT and you'll just need to click on the women's specific poster on the GCN app. Now, just before we get onto the riders taking part, a reminder that we've got a complete collection of classics t-shirts, which Sai is currently modeling now. Oh, yeah. Fresh for 2023, including one to celebrate the Ronda, the second monument of the season. It's looking good as well. Love That's the right. You say fresh, the design is fresh, but this t-shirt ain't fresh. Dan might not be here in person, but let's just say he's here in spirit, Connor, because uh, unfortunately, I still haven't been given access to any of the new t-shirt designs. I'm literally wearing Dan's old t-shirt. So thank you very much for that. 
the, honestly, the things I have to do, kind of. Uh, right, they are available, all the clean ones, uh, now over at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com, as is the Fan's Guide to Cycling, uh, which is a cracking book for everyone, particularly those of you that are getting into the sport and you want a greater understanding of it. It really gets, gets inside it, doesn't it? Some cracking insight from all sorts of people in that one. For sure, for sure. Right now, though, it's time to head over to the riders who will be taking part in Flanders and see who our favourites are going to be, starting with the men's. Yeah, the three amigos, as some have nicknamed them, Tane Pogaccia, Wout Van Aert and Mathieu van der Poel, are the firm favourites for Duranda. However, who deserves the title of out-and-out favourite kind of depends on who you ask, doesn't it? Personally, I'm looking at Wout van Aert to beat this weekend. I know at times he was slightly on the ropes in E3, but despite the best efforts of Van der Poel and Pogaccia, he could not be dropped nope. before then sprinting to take the win in supreme fashion. A few days later at Ghent Wervergum, he looked on another level, riding clear of teammate Christophe Laporte. He seemed to have to turn himself inside out just to hold his wheel before being gifted the win at the finish. Whilst it must be said, Pogaccia and Van der Poel chose to miss Wervergum, they must have nervously watched Wout's performance. Well, yeah, they must have done, I guess. Um, I said that Van Aert's biggest strength has got to be his team at Flanders, isn't yeah. it? And the cards of Laporte and Van Bala to play as serious contenders, plus the likes of Van Hooydonk uh, and Bonu as backup. But that said, UAE have been mega impressive. They've got a strong team, haven't they? That's a good point Tim as well. Tim Wellens, Matteo Trentin, looking super good supporting him. And Alberson de Koenig as well, Son Cry Anderson. Now, he is a sneaky card to play. That is true. So, and I think gone are the years when you can just look at Lotto Jumbo as the team to watch. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Let's talk about Van der Poel, though, because he plays second in E3, getting beaten by Van Aert in yeah. the sprint. But it must be said, he looks slightly more comfortable on the climbs. I think, personally, his tactic will almost certainly be to attack the race as early as possible, isolate Van Aert and distance him by the finish. By flying under the radar and choosing to miss both Wervelgum and Dwarsdorf of Vlaanderen, it'll be hard to make a call on which direction his form is heading, but if he lines up at Flanders in better shape than E3, Van Aert will definitely be worried. The problem for Van der Poel is that if he does race aggressively, he'll have to be careful not to put himself under too much pressure and allow Pogaccia to pounce. Well, that is the big question, isn't it? Pogaccia tried plenty of times to break both Van Aert and Van der Poel in E3, but he just didn't quite manage no. it, did he? I mean, nearly Van Aert. It's got Very his... nearly. I thought he was going, but then he just fought his way back on. And E3 is not as tough a course, is it, as Flanders? No, the difference is the length of Flanders, and it does ramp up in difficulty. So yeah. that's going to play towards Pogaccia. And Pogaccia does look to be the strongest on the climbs, doesn't he? Now, Flanders is, of course, the hardest of all the classics with plenty more climbs to tackle. So that, as you said, that's going to prove the difference, I think, isn't it? He'll have more opportunities to turn the screw, try and ride clear, preferably solo. We can't write off his sprint entirely. No. It's got to be said, after such a hard race, if he does go to the line with Van Aert and Van der Poel, he still potentially has the finish to get the better of them. But after E3, I kind of don't fancy his chances there, really. Neither do I. I think he's going to want to go solo. They're, those three, though, are looking head and shoulders above the rest, but there are plenty of others waiting in the wings. Set Van Mark, looking increasingly strong for Israel Premier Tech, riding strongly in the E3 and taking third at Wevelgem. Yeah, Mas Pedersen of Patrex Agafredo has also been knocking on the door recently and always seems to be there or thereabouts, doesn't he, in the big races. Um, as of late, sixth in San Remo and fifth in E3. He's got the engine and he's got the sprint to prove troublesome on the flat run into Odenada. Stefan Kung also deserves a mention, looking like he has deserved more from his last few races and showing some serious strength on a number of occasions. His best finish this classic season is sixth at E3, and he'll definitely be in the mix when things begin to ramp up. Hopefully he's recovered from his illness. That's another point as yep. well, but he's a hammer, so I'm sure he will. <laughs> Others to watch include Tom Pidcock, who returns from a spell away from racing due to the concussion he suffered at Torino. His team Ineos suffered bad luck at Wervergum with both Garner and Kiwakowski crashing hard. So they'll be hoping for a reversal of that fortune come Sunday. Now, what about our best shout for an underdog victory? I mean, this is, a, this is a big call, isn't it, Flanders? Matteo Jorgensen, potentially. He definitely looks to have stepped up a level this year. Was the best of the rest at E3, coming in fourth. But also, you've got to say, what a win that would be for the young American yeah. on Movistar as well. I mean, that would be massive, That would be proper cool, wouldn't yeah. it? Proper, proper cool. I think there's plenty others to look out for. I think Florian Vermeersch, lot of destiny. He's been looking pretty strong, hasn't yeah. he? Bidim Gramai. Also, he hasn't quite been hitting the mark this classic season. Well, he but did hit a pole. 
though, didn't he, on, uh, on Sunday Wevelgum. against yeah. Wevelgum. Yeah, so uh, given that he won there the previous year, wasn't a great ending for him. But I wouldn't count him out because he was up there in the mix at San Remo, wasn't yeah. he? Alver Alberto Betiol, yeah. former winner. EF have been firing on all cylinders. Not in the Northern Classics yet, but... You know, I don't think they've quite had their A-team, have they? And Nilsson Paulus is going to join him. That'll be interesting to see how he gets on. Um, and then also there was one other rider. Michael was... Matthews, what about him? Well, could he get to the line? Could he contend that sprint? I kind of feel like we've been talking about him for many years, but he's never quite managed to... Could be the year. He's been going pretty well back at his old team. Well, there we go then. OK, that's our predictions then for the men's side of things. Now, of course, plenty we haven't mentioned aside from our favourites. Flanders is such an open race. And that's oh, Matty Maharic. Matty Maharic. I knew there was someone else yeah. you had have mentioned. Yeah. But Flanders is such an open race. That's what makes it such a brilliant one. And it does feel strange, though, to have not mentioned the entire Sudar Quick Step team. Mm, that is a good point, yeah. I mean, they haven't really been hitting the mark at all this classic season, have they? A win by Tim Merlier aside. The thought was backed up, though, by team manager Patrick Lefebvre, who said the best thing about E3 last week was the lunch he had during the race and he <laughs> told his squad what he thought about their subpar performance on the bus which is quite a bit awkward yeah it's pretty bad isn't it if anyone can turn their fortunes around though it's got to be quick step the experience in yeah. that squad and they're going to be hoping that Alaphilippe is finally firing on all cylinders come Sunday and if he is you can't count him out if he's not I don't know really it's not looking good. Maybe they just have to wait for the uh, Ardennes Classics yeah. like last year. Uh, right, anyway, next up, let's see who the contenders are in the women's race. There are two riders who took their first big one-day wins last week, and we'll start with both of them. Pfeiffer Georgie took a brilliant win at Brugge de Panna, riding solo to victory by over a minute by the finish. In fact, the British rider for DSM looked confidently strong at Wolverhampton 2, coming in 11th place after riding back from a crash, closing numerous gaps to bring herself into contention. I think in the form she's in, Georgie is definitely amongst the favourites this weekend. She's got to be. She's looking really, really strong. Yeah, I think so. Marlon Rousseff, SD Works as well, was a second. She took the first Swiss win at Wevelgem in another strong solo display of form. She actually won by over two and a half minutes, even though she took a wrong turn before the finish. But she had plenty of time to correct that one. With a ride like that on Sunday, it will be incredibly hard to bring her back if she manages to get any form of daylight between herself and the rest of the field. Although it's got to be said, I suspect those weather conditions that they had at Gent Weather again, they kind of exacerbate any gaps, don't they? Because yeah. people just crack. It was particularly challenging in Wevelgem. She will be looking to ride away from some serious talent though. Annemiek van Vluten will no doubt be seen as out and out race favourite as she looks to take her third victory in Flanders. Her last race, Starada Bianco, saw her take fourth and that was back at the start of March. She hasn't raced since, but the current world champion is known for her incredible training prep and she knows this race so well, she's always flying for it. So I personally wouldn't question her spot as race favourite. No, oh. I don't know. I don't know. It'll be interesting. Like you say, she trains brilliantly, and all her training rides are up on Strava, I see. So, like, I get bombarded with them every day. I'm like, oh, fair enough. <laughs> she's, yeah, she's quite an epic, epic trainer. Lorena Vibes will be the one who'll look to keep herself in contention, won't she, with hopes of a sprint for the win into the finish in 09. Despite DNF and getting Wevel game, she has, remember, already notched up three wins this year and a strong third place at De Panna, plus a second at Noca Cursa. Flanders does usually prove a little bit too hilly for her, but if she is taken to the line, she's going to be hard to beat, isn't she? She's going to be hard to beat at the line. Elisa Longo Borghini is another key favourite to look out for. Previous winner of Flanders back in 2015, the Trek rider will be looking to her experience to repeat that performance. The Italian had a quiet start to the year so far, but got the season going well with an overall win in the UAE Tour. Her knowledge of the race counts for so much. And in a race like Flanders, that is gold. Expect her to make the most of any indecision by her rivals. Yeah, last year's winner, Lotta Capecchi, is also deserving of a big mention. She will once more be a massive favourite at the Ronda. With wins at Noca Cursa and Het Newsblad, she has arguably been the rider to watch this classic season. The Belgian rider is part of that strong team as well, SD Works. If she's heavily marked at Flanders, the rest of the race will have to keep an eye on her teammates, Lorena Vibes, who we've already mentioned, and Demi Vollering, if they want to take victory. Yeah, Demi Vollering 
took a cracking win at Charlie Bianchi too and is a firm favourite for Flanders in her own right. However, it's that strength of SD Works as a whole that will prove the biggest challenge if anyone outside the Dutch squad wants to take victory. It could also prove a challenge to SD Works as well, because you mentioned that win at Strada Bianca, you kind of can't not acknowledge the fact that Lotta Capecchi was there, wasn't she, shoulder to shoulder, and there was a little bit of animosity. A little bit, so there's almost the rivalry inside the team as well that they'll have to deal with and decide who's going to take the win out Absolutely, of them all. Absolutely, yeah, they need a strong team manager, don't they, to map to... Yeah. Uh... And that's important in Flanders too, because it is just so many calls that are going off, so many different moves. It's quite hard to keep track of. Yeah, no gifts in Doronda. No. So, we know the course, we know the riders, but what about the all-important weather? Connor. Well, as we record this, we're about six days out from the race, but the provisional forecast for Sunday is about 9 or 10 degrees Celsius with a 70% chance of rain. It's basically your typical Flanders conditions, really. But the wind is coming from the north, around 13, 15 kilometres an hour. So that should mean, roughly, it's kind of a cross-tailwind start. So probably quite a fast start in both races and maybe a bit of a kind of cross-headwind at the finish. OK, so well, a fast start for the men's race, wouldn't it? I think, mainly, which will play into the hands of the big three who will want it as hard as possible from the gun, won't they? Yeah, I think they want to get the pace going and not allow people to rest on their laurels too much, not give the breakaway too much leash and start, um, yeah, ramping the pace up early doors. Right, well, let's hope the wind picks up to be even stronger then. Now then, Connor, what about the all-important predictions? <sighs> OK, given that Dan is not here and I am in Dan's seat and his T-shirt, <laughs> I'm going to go first, right? Head says Van Aert. Yeah. Heart says Van der Poel. I'm going to go with my heart. Van der Poel for the win on the men's side of things. On the women's side of things, I think Pecky. Okay. From Demi Vollering. Interesting. I think both races are just so open this year more than ever. Really? I think so. I think they're just quite hard to call. Well, in the men's race, it's out of the three. I was going to say it's one of three, yeah. isn't it? Surely. <laughs> but I'm going to go for Van Aert. Are you? I think so. I think, if he, I think if his form ramps up enough and he hangs in there, I just don't see how the other two can beat him. Yeah. Famous and last words. As you said, Jumbo Visma are mega strong. Yeah. On paper, they are stronger than UE and Alpecin de Kerner, can't they? I think so. I think we've just got the numbers to, to cause, a, cause a riot in that race. <laughs> um, in the women's, Van Vluten, I'm going to go with world champion. Really? A, a third win. I think that'd be pretty cool. I think it would be very yeah. cool, actually. Either way... Whoever wins both races can pretty much be guaranteed to be absolute corkers, can't they? And I, for one, cannot wait to watch. Whether I get to watch it live is another matter. But if I don't, whatever you do, don't text me the results. I don't want to know. I'm just going to be like a little tortoise, go into my shell <laughs> and then watch on demand on Sunday evening. But, uh, but there we go. One of the best races of the year, for sure. Your favourite? Yeah, my favourite of the year. It's just, oh, it was always an occasion. When I lived out in Belgium, this was just, it's just mental when the run's on. Everything else stops and everyone just watches the race and I just got sucked into that. So every time it's on, I just have to watch it. There you go. Stop what you're doing on Sunday. Come join us for live coverage on GCN+. Plus. Also, now let us know in the comments section who you are going to be rooting for, who you think is going to win. Thanks, as always, for watching. See you on Sunday. Roll on the Ronde.